This is the study Watchtower article of February 2017 on the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses and what they will be teaching this year, this coming year. Jehovah's Witnesses follow the governing body. They are the leaders of the Watchtower. Who is leading God's people today? Remember those who are taking the lead among you. Jesus' apostles stood on the Mount of Olives, gazing at the sky. They had just seen their master and friend, Jesus, lifted up and obscured by a cloud. For some two years, Jesus had taught, encouraged, and led them. Now he was gone. What would they do? Jesus had given his followers a commission. You will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the most distant part of the earth. If that's the case, why aren't the Jehovah's Witnesses called Jesus' Witnesses? How could they possibly complete that assignment? True, Jesus had assured them that they would soon receive Holy Spirit in the word case. Still, an international preaching campaign required direction and organization. To direct and organize his people in ancient times, Jesus used visible representatives. Hence, the apostles might have wondered, will Jehovah now appoint a new leader? Less than two weeks later, Jesus' disciples consulted the scriptures, prayed for divine direction, and chose Theus to replace Judas Iscariot as the twelfth apostle. Why was this selection so important to them and to Jehovah? Matthias filled a vital organizational need. Jesus had selected his apostles not merely to accompany him in his ministry, but to play a crucial role among God's people. What was that role, and how did Jehovah, through Jesus, equip them to fill it? What similar arrangement exists among God's people today? And how can we remember those who are taking the lead among us, especially those who make up the faithful and discreet slave? A visible body under an invisible leader. At Pentecost 33 CE, the apostles began to take the lead in the Christian congregation. On that occasion, Peter stood up with the eleven and shared life-saving truths with a large crowd of Jews and proselytes. Many of them became believers. Thereafter, these new Christians continued devoting themselves to the teaching of the apostles. The apostles managed the financial resources of the congregation. They cared for the spiritual needs of God's people, stating, We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And they assigned experienced Christians to advance the evangelizing work in new territories. In time, other anointed elders joined the apostles in administering the affairs of the congregations. As a governing body, they gave direction to all the congregations. Christians in the first century recognized that the governing body was directed by Jehovah God through their leader, Jesus. How could they be sure of this? Now that is the vital question. <clears throat> first, Holy Spirit empowered the governing body. Holy Spirit was poured out on all anointed Christians, but it specifically enabled the apostles and other elders in Jerusalem to fulfill their role as overseers. For example, in 49 CE, Holy Spirit guided the governing body to make a decision regarding the issue of circumcision. The congregations followed their direction and continued to be made firm in the faith and to increase in number day by day. The letter conveying that decision also reveals that the governing body manifested the fruitage of God's Spirit, including love and faith. Second, angels assisted the governing body. Before Cornelius was baptized as the first uncircumcised Gentile Christian, an angel directed him to send for the Apostle Peter. After Peter preached to Cornelius and his relatives, Holy Spirit was poured out on them, although the men had not been circumcised. This prompted the Apostles and other brothers to submit to God's will and accept uncircumcised Gentiles into the Christian congregation. Moreover, angels actively promoted and accelerated the preaching work that the governing body was overseeing. Third, God's word guided the governing body. Whether they were settling doctrinal issues or they were giving organizational direction, 
those spirit-anointed elders were led by the scriptures. Although the governing body had authority in the early congregation, they acknowledged that their leader was Jesus. He, Christ, gave some as apostles, wrote the Apostle Paul. Let us by love grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Instead of naming themselves after a prominent apostle, the disciples were by divine providence called Christians. True, Paul acknowledged the importance of holding fast the traditions or scripturally based practices given by the apostles and other men who took the lead. Nevertheless, he added, But I want you to know that the head of every man, including every member of the governing body, is the Christ. In turn, the head of the Christ is God. Yes, under his head, Jehovah God, the invisible and glorified Christ Jesus, was leading the congregation. This is not man's work. In the late 19th century, Charles Taze Russell and some of his associates endeavored to reestablish re-establish true Christian worship. To help them disseminate Bible truth in various languages, Zion's Watchtower Tract Society was legally incorporated in 1884 with Brother Russell as president. He was an outstanding student of the Bible and he fearlessly exposed as false such doctrines as the Trinity and the immortality of the soul. He discerned that Christ would return invisibly and that the appointed times of the nations would end in 1914. Brother Russell devoted his time, energy, and money unsparingly to share these truths with others. Clearly, at that pivotal time, Brother Russell was used by Jehovah and the head of the congregation. Brother Russell did not seek glory from humans. In 1896, he wrote, We want no homage, no reverence, for ourselves or our writings, nor do we wish to be called reverend or rabbi, nor do we wish that any should be called by our name. He later stated, this is not man's work. In 1919, three years after Brother Russell's death, Jesus appointed the faithful and discreet slave. For what purpose? To give his domestics food at the proper time. Even in those early years, a small group of anointed brothers who served at headquarters in Brooklyn, New York, prepared and distributed spiritual food to Jesus' followers. The expression, governing body, began appearing in our publications in the 1940s, when it was understood to be closely connected with the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. However, in 1971, the governing body was distinguished from the Watchtower Society, a legal instrument rather than a scriptural entity and its directors. The governing body henceforth included anointed brothers who are not society directors. In recent years, responsible brothers of the other sheep have served as directors of the legal society and of other corporations used by God's people, thus allowing the governing body to focus on providing spiritual instruction and direction. The July 15, 2013 issue of the Watchtower explained that the faithful and discreet slave is a small group of anointed brothers who make up the governing body. The governing body makes important decisions collectively. How so? The members meet weekly, which fosters close communication and unity. Each year they rotate chairmanship at those meetings since no member of the governing body is considered to be more important than the other members. Each of the six committees of the governing body rotate chairmanship in the same way, and each member of that body views himself not as the leader of his fellow brothers, but as one of the domestics fed by the faithful slave and subject to its oversight. Who really is the faithful and discreet slave? The governing body is neither inspired nor infallible. Therefore, it can err in doctrinal matters or in organizational direction. So he's basically just, just like another guy sweeping a floor, you could say. In fact, the Watchtower Publications Index includes the heading Beliefs Clarified, 
which lists adjustments in our scriptural understanding since 1870. Beliefs clarified. New Light. They should just name the watchtower New Light. Of course, Jesus did not tell us that his faithful slave would produce perfect spiritual food. So how can we answer Jesus' question, who really is the faithful and discreet slave? What evidence is there that the governing body is filling that role? Let us consider the same three factors that directed the governing body in the first century. Evidence of Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has helped the governing body to grasp scriptural truths not previously understood. For example, reflect on the list of leaves clarified that was referred to in the preceding paragraph. Surely no human deserves credit for discovering and explaining these deep things of God. The governing body echoes the Apostle Paul who wrote, These things we also speak, not with words taught by human wisdom, but with those taught by the Spirit. After centuries of apostasy and spiritual darkness, can anything other than the Holy Spirit explain the rapid increase in spiritual understanding since 1919? Evidence of angelic assistance. The governing body today has the colossal task of overseeing an international preaching work involving over 8 million evangelizers. Why has that work been so successful? For one, angels are involved. In many cases, publishers have called on individuals who would just been praying for help. The overall growth of the preaching and disciple-making work, despite fierce opposition in some lands, has likewise been possible only with superhuman assistance. Reliance on God's Word Consider what occurred in 1973. The June 1st issue of the Watchtower asked the question, Do persons who have not broken their addiction to tobacco qualify for baptism? The answer was, The scriptural evidence points to the conclusion that they do not. After citing several relevant scriptures, the Watchtower explained why an unrepentant smoker should be disfellowshipped. It is said this represents no effort to act in an arbitrary, dictatorial manner. The strictness really proceeds from God, who expresses himself through his written word. Has any other re religious organization been willing to rely fully on God's word, even when doing so presents a real challenge to some of its members? A recent book on religion in the United States notes, Christian leaders have regularly revised their teachings to match the beliefs and opinions gaining support among their members in the larger society. If those of the governing body allow God's word rather than popular opinion to guide their decisions, who is really leading God's people today? Let's just go back up here and look at this. Here's a picture of the governing body, 1950s. Some of these guys I've never even seen before. I know who those guys are. That's Nathan Knorr. That's Fred Franz. But now we know all of these guys. Uh, they show a bunch of Watchtower articles here through the years, the decades. And it says, since it's its appointment in 1919, the faithful slave has prepared spiritual food for God's people. Remember those who are taking the lead. Read Hebrews 13, 7. The word rendered remember can also be translated mention. Therefore, one way you can remember those who are taking the lead is by mentioning the governing body in your prayers. Think about that. Remember Jesus' um, instructional prayer to the Father? Well, just imagine Jesus saying to pray for the governing body. That's quite a thing to write. Mentioning the governing body in your prayers. Reflect on their responsibility to supply spiritual food to oversee the global preaching work, and to manage donated funds. Surely they need our persistent petitions 
in their behalf. Of course, remembering the governing body involves not just words, but also cooperation with its direction. The governing body provides the direction given in our publications and at our meetings, assemblies, and conventions. In addition, it appoints circuit overseers who in turn appoint congregation elders. Circuit overseers and elders remember the governing body by sticking closely to guidelines given to them. All of us show respect for our leader, Jesus, by being obedient and submissive to the men he is using to direct us. Another way that we remember the governing body is by exerting ourselves in the preaching work. After all, Paul urged Christians to imitate the faith of those taking the lead among them. The faithful slave has exercised outstanding faith by zealously promoting and spreading the kingdom good news. Are you one of the other sheep who supports the anointed in this vital work? How happy you will feel when your leader, Jesus, says, To the extent that you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. <clears throat> when Jesus returned to heaven, he did not abandon his followers. He knew firsthand how much the Holy Spirit, the angels, and God's word helped him to take the lead when he was on earth. Therefore, he has supplied the faithful slave today with the same assistance. As anointed Christians, the members of that slave keep following the Lamb no matter where he goes. As we follow their direction, therefore, we follow our Lord, sorry, our leader, Jesus. Soon he will lead us to everlasting life, and no human leader can promise that. They might as well call the governing body their Lord. Because if you're following them, you're following Jesus. Wow. There's not much new since uh, 2013. Not much has changed. But... Uh, the more they have articles, the more they have public talks, the more the brothers and sisters talk about it, the more they meditate on it, the more they pray about it, the more they will view these janitors, you could call them, as their Lord, their saviors. They are the leaders. You have to listen to them. This is the pyramid scheme. These guys are on the top. Like we read in this article, they have the circuit overseers. Then they have the elders. And these guys from the top down appoint each other. Now these guys, they're imperfect and they're not inspired. And they are always changing with new light. You guys are praying for these guys like you would be praying for the Pope. These are the Jehovah's Witnesses, Popes. someone who is considered an anointed witness, uh, who has worked uh, in scriptural, uh, with a scriptural background, either as a missionary or a full-time servant for many years, 
and is able to fulfill the role of the governing body, which is, may I state, a spiritual group of men who are the guardians of our doctrine. And as guardians of the doctrine, look at things that need to be decided based on our doctrines, which are based on the Constitution of the Bible. Now, the same principles apply to clarifications in our beliefs. The governing body loves to get together and discuss the Bible. And when those Bibles come out on the table, and when the brothers bring their research in, and they're starting to search the Scriptures and analyze the Scriptures, you see the happy smiles on their faces. The brothers love discussing spiritual things. But the clarifications are often, are often a long time in coming into print. Why? Because the clarification on one scripture can have a domino effect on others. The clarification on one scripture can have ramifications on other prophecies. So we have to be absolutely sure that everything fits. Peter's loyalty was based on solid evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. His loyalty was evidence of his faith. That is the kind of loyalty we want to imitate today. There are times we must wait on Jehovah to clarify matters. In the meantime, may we prove ourselves loyal, like Peter, and follow closely the lead of the faithful slave who closely follow in the footsteps of their master, Jesus.